All right, welcome to West Orlando WordPress. We are one of the newest WordPress groups in the area. We've only been going since uh, November, like mid-November of last year. So this is a great group we've got going so far. Um, there's another group in uh, Orlando proper called Orlando West, sorry, what are they called? WordPress Orlando, sorry. <laughs> Um, and they, uh, they've been around for a long, long time. They've got thousands of members. Um, they get, you know, 60, 70 people at their meetups. They're actually in charge of the WordCamp this year, which Hope's going to talk about um, after, after I'm done. But uh, they're a, a bigger group, so we're trying to mirror what they're doing a little bit. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how, the, how we're structured and what we do. Um, but thank you, everyone, for being here. <coughs> Not my turn to speak, but the person who, <laughs> who was going to give this presentation, uh, he, he had to be out of town for work. So um, he's, he's given me his notes, and he's also recorded a video that we'll, we'll watch of him talking about how he's done some things. And especially for those who are in government, um, he also has done um, accessibility for governments, small government, and like you know bureaus and stuff like that, police departments, you know that kind of thing. So his video will go more in depth than some of the stuff I'm going to do. So. Without further ado, we'll jump into this. Um, at the bottom there is a link uh, for, uh, for this presentation. So I'm going to post this out on the meetup when we're done, like later tonight or tomorrow or something. You can just click on that link and, and it'll take you straight into the presentation. So my name is Rob. Um, I'm the CEO of webedextras.com. We're a small web development agency here in this area, I'm trying to build up a presence here in Orlando. Um, I've been doing web development since 1996, so quite a while. Um, and so yeah, that's me. Um, Chris Jerski, who was going to give the presentation, he's an organizational engineer for VitalHelpDesk.com, and so he's he's really good with security stuff. So you may want to link up with him at some point. So yeah, so <clears throat> today's topic was prepared by him, and he sent it to me. It's uh, web accessibility. We've talked about this before. Um, but it's been a popular ask to start over again and just kind of go more in depth. So we're going to do that again. And it's a whole new group, most of you guys. So <laughs> first time exposure for y'all. Um, so just the basics. Accessibility is a huge, huge. Whenever the government's involved in anything, is it not just big? <laughs> you know, there's like three different documents you've got to keep track of and just hundreds of pages of stuff. Regulations, like crazy different levels of accessibility, compliance. It just goes on and on. And so we're going to kind of do like the 40,000 foot level here and just kind of point you to some resources, familiarize you with the space a little bit, um, and then we'll move. Uh, then, you know, if you have any questions, we have a Slack channel that you can log into. It's a little chat system. You can ask your questions in there. You know, hopefully we'll see it and we'll, we'll answer. More people in there, more answers can happen. All right, so <clears throat> we're going to cover what is an accessible website. We're going to cover accessibility issues to consider. Again, quite high level. Um, some key websites to know, some key plugins that are going to help you with this stuff. Thank goodness. <laughs> That's why we love WordPress. There's always a plugin for something. In this case, there's probably 20 or 30. Um, and then I have the video presentation that Chris put together. So that's kind of the basic outline. So what is an accessible website? Do you have poor, poor accessibility? So, <laughs> really clever. Um, perceivable, okay? So, if a user can perceive what the content is, regardless of whatever device they're using, whatever browser they're using, whatever accommodation system that a person is using to access your content, are they able to perceive that content and make sense of it? That's like the, the primary driver of why we do accessibility. So, just a little backstory on some of that. My mother was born with cerebral palsy. And she was mainstreamed into the public school system when nobody was being mainstreamed with her condition. So she, she was able to walk, you know, with a lot of therapy. By the age of seven, she was able to walk, like, from here to those lockers. So she had a long uphill battle, but she got into the public school system. But there were hardly any accommodations for her. So she really kind of bootstrapped her way into life, became a public librarian, you know, built a new library for our town eventually, cl close to her retirement. But... Prior to that, she was actually, this was about the time that the ADA came out, the city was trying to kind of railroad her out so that they could either close down the library and 
save money, which was stupid. Everybody loved the library. It, it was a dumb thing. What a, what a platform to run on, right? <laughs> Um, or you know they just they, they considered her a liability, right? And so they even wrote her a letter saying you know you're, you you fell a couple of times at work, so we're, our insurance company is telling us that we have to let you go, which was completely illegal. But they had a really bad lawyer, so <laughs> um, but so she was fighting that. They also complained oh, the patrons can't understand you when you speak, which was a lie, bogus, and people who didn't they weren't patient enough. So they tried to accommodate her with a laptop that would speak for her. She found it offensive, <laughs> obviously, because she's been doing that job for like, I don't know, 15 years by that point. So yeah, so, but we live in a whole new world now where people just don't get away with that stuff anymore, especially small governments, right? And so small governments especially have to make those accommodations. They're the biggest targets right now, and we'll talk about that. Um, so it has to be, okay, getting back to this topic, <clears throat> it has to be perceivable. You have to be able to operate it. So can the user navigate through your website? Can they, can they access all the links? Can they get alternate versions of images, can they, you know, fill out forms, that kind of thing. <clears throat> Is it understood? Forms and menus and links be easily understood. Is the labeling correct? Is the labeling contextually informative, right? If we say lear learn more, right, we don't know for sure what that pertains to. So we need to say learn more about X, right? Um, and robust, screen readers. So there's like screen readers, there's voice recognition, braille readers, there's a whole bunch of different devices, different manufacturers, um, different capabilities. So we have to we have to build websites that are robust with all this stuff. So, how many here have built a website from scratch? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, good. Six, including me. So, it's hard enough building a website from scratch and trying to make it responsive for all screen sizes, right? Um, make it load fast so that Google search will you know rank you high. And so your users don't get frustrated. And now we, let, we add on this layer. And this is the most complicated layer of all. And that's a reason that a lot of people don't do accessibility. They just don't get into it because they're like, ah, oh, I'm just going to push that off because I, I didn't budget for it. It was an afterthought. You know, it was something we didn't think about. But this bottom thing here, usability is a requirement, not a bonus feature. I struggle with this because, and I shouldn't, because my mother went through all this stuff, right? But it literally is, for, us, for those of us who are abled, who have abilities and not disabilities, it's not a big deal, right? Because we just kind of don't think about it. But for other people, it is a big deal. Um, for people who are shut in because they have vision problems or mobility problems, this is their connection to the world. And the sites that we build make that possible for them. So, yay raw um, accessibility. I'm gonna try to do better myself. Um, any questions so far? No? And I'm going to ask this question. Colorblind? My son is colorblind, so he always gets things confused, like driving and things. It's kind of scary. But, um, but yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about colorblindness as well as we approach the subject. All right, so issues to consider. Easy text-based navigation. We touched on that. Tab navigation using only your keyboard. Some people cannot use mice, right? And they can't see to even use it at all, right? If, it depends on you know, visibility or mobility. Index PDFs are better than image PDFs. That's, a t that's, that's one that surprises a lot of people, right? <laughs> so an index PDF is basically text that you can, like if you can move your mouse over it and you can select text and copy paste to somewhere else, that's indexed. If you just get a whole screen of blue when you, when you select, that means it's an image. Images are almost impenetrable. It's just like a big black brick wall, right, for a lot of people who can't screen it or can't read it. Um, move your PDF forms to HTML forms. I, I kind of think this is a, a better way anyway. <laughs> I hate filling out PDF forms. Like when I go to a website, like a government website, and they throw a PDF there, oh, you can fill this out online. I hate those. Right? I'd much rather deal with a, a web form. So um, Word and Excel. Definitely not ADA compliant. Perhaps Microsoft has some accommodations, but there is much, much more that they just cannot be compliant with. Um, so lately, legal targets are, are large businesses, local, state, and federal. But as I've shared this in the past too, um, there is somebody here in Florida who is disabled, and she's targeting a lot of smaller businesses with lawsuits. And she's settling out of court and getting a lot of money. 
um, and for kind of forcing these small businesses. And it's one of those things where I'm like, having known what my mom went through, I'm like, okay, good for you. You're forcing the issue. On the other hand, I'm like, I'm a small business owner. <laughs> this kind of sucks. <laughs> so, um, but... Florida and New York State are the two states that lead the nation in ADA lawsuits over websites, and it's definitely not small. It's definitely not small government and um, big businesses anymore. It's now smaller businesses, dry cleaners, chiropractors, doctors' offices, you name it. They're going after you. So it's something to reduce your risk exposure on. All right. So three key websites here. The the core legal guidance is found at ada.gov. Yes? Uh, this is going to be posted up, so they don't yes. necessarily have to write right. it down. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. I try to make this as, as easy for everybody. If you want to take a picture of it with your yeah. phone, you can, but... Just for safety. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't always get everything correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you can take a picture if you want, but I'm going to post it anyway. So if you're following on, on meetup.com, on our group there, uh, we're on Facebook, we're on Slack, um, I try to make as much exposure as we can get. So the core legal guidance is at ada.gov. The core web guidance is at w3.org. W3 is the consortium group that kind of came up with the standards for the web a long, long time ago. So that's anything you, anything you want to know about anything with the web, how to do stuff, W3 is your friend. Um, they're a little slow on the uptake sometimes on new things, but that's the way it's supposed to be, I guess. So ICT refresh is basically taking two sections of, uh, of accessibility, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act and Section 255 of the Communication Act. It basically is a, is a site that kind of takes all of that information, summarizes what happens with those, what we need to comply with, et cetera. So that last one is long. <laughs> if, you, if you're having a hard time sleeping at night, maybe just you know pull that open and just zonk out. But all of these are kind of long and boring. So the legal and the web guidance, those are, I use those as references, right? Um, I mean, you could read through them all, but <laughs> it's like reading the tax code. Um, so plugins, we love plugins. They help us, they make our lives easier. So there are three big ones that I have kind of seen used a lot. Um, UserWay is the big one that I see because there's like a little um, icon in the top right of some websites with a little handicap you know, symbol. Um, and you click on that and you get a whole bunch of accessibility options for a website. So people use that to test a website and I think some people even use it to use websites if they have uh, accessibility issues. Um, that's the free one. And it's actually really good for free. I mean, it's pretty good. Um, online ADA, that's $347 per year. That's the low price. That's the, there's tiers above that. Um, so this one is actually a plugin that sits in your dashboard. I don't show the dashboard around it, but it's in your, your WordPress dashboard, and you can just run a report on your own website, and it will tell you everything that's wrong, which is nice, because then you just have a checklist, and you go through and fix it. We like simple. Um, Accessibly is kind of the same thing as um, UserWay. It's got its own little um, widget that pops out on your website, and you can test things and, and, and do all that. So... Um, I wish I could do a demo of all of these, but um, Chris's presentation is actually really informative and it's about 20 minutes long, so I want to make sure I get to that too. Um, then there's this other list. <laughs> so these are like specialized simulators, plugins and extensions that you can use for specific tasks re relating to accessibility. So you have a screen reader testing apps uh, for the Mac, for Windows, and you also have JAWS. JAWS is the one I'm, I'm most familiar with. Not that I've used it, but I've heard of it the most. Um, I used to work for an educational publishing company, and that was part of their accessibility initiative was to make sure that JAWS, everything we did digital was JAWS compliant. Um, you have general accessibility. You have the Axe Accessibility Tool, Code Sniffer, Funkify. I'm just going to show you Funkify. It's actually kind of fun. So if you want to get the experience of what it's like for somebody who has a specific condition, this is really, really cool. You can come in here. I've already installed the, inst the extension, but it has a simulator for cognition, for dyslexia, uh, motor function, vision. Um, there's all kinds of stuff in here. Um, so if I go into the simulator here, let's say I want to simulate being dyslexic, and I click the Start button. 
that's what as far as we can see for people who have dyslexia, right? Can you see how that'd be really frustrating? <laughs> So you can let it keep running if you want to, because for some people that's that's how it is. Um, but you can also pause it and just like take a snapshot and see, oh gosh, here's what I need to fix, right? <laughs> so, um, and I, I think there are, you'll want to consult those other documents I mentioned for what to do in specific situations. Um, <clears throat> but, so let's look at Color Carl next. So this is this is normal vision here. Now this projector, the color is a bit off on this because I noticed my own website was kind of uh, darker than I wanted it to be. But if I click on grayscale, you'll see all the color disappears, right? If I click on green, where people are uh, colorblind in the green spectrum, you'll see a difference there. And then red, green, even more differences. People's faces start to turn like a sepia or a green tone, right? So this is what this is what it's like to live with color blindness. So that's what I love about this is it kind of gives you a little bit of reason for it. Makes you feel a little bit more um, motivated to do this stuff. So here's somebody who has blurry vision, right? Now a friend of mine, I, was, I, I invited him to come tonight, but um, his wife's out of town and he can't drive because he can't see. So he wasn't able to come, but um, I wanted to show you kind of what, um, basically what he's described to me as the issue for his vision. I can remember what it was. Uh, which one was it? Wasn't tonal Toby? I think it was peripheral. Yep, yeah, here we are. So anywhere I move the mouse, that's simulating where your eyes go. And he's described it to me as if you hold a tennis ball in front of your face at about this, at about arm's length. That's that's what he sees is just like a kind of a blob in the middle. My grandmother had this macular degeneration, right? And it just messes with your center vision. Now she could see everything peripherally, right? We'd be driving and I'd be going like 75 miles an hour in a 55 and she's like, you're going too fast. I'm like, how do you know? You're blind. She's like, because I can't go by too fast. I'm like, all right. <laughs> okay, grandma, you got it. So, you know, that's what it's like for people with macular degeneration. Then there's the opposite of that. I mean, it's kind of eye-opening, so to speak. Um, you know, there are people who now, when I was in college, I remember seeing people with vision problems trying to use the web, and they had big old like magnification instruments, and they'd hold it up to the screen so they could kind of see everything. Um, they were like covering an eye, they were you know changing the colors on the screens, inverting everything so black was white and white was black. I mean, there's all kinds of adaptations that they have to make just to get around our designs, right? So, but yeah, so that's that's one great tool. Um, Another good one is, I think it's Contrast Checker. Oh, yeah, th yeah, this is actually a really good one. So here's a baseline, right? You got black text on white. That shows you kind of all of the levels of um, Section 508 compliance that you have, AA, AAA, um, and all the different, you know, gives you little badges to kind of show you your progress. But if I change, the foreground to say a light blue, all of that starts to uh, deteriorate. So now you see the scores drop. So that's nice. If you're picking colors, you want to know how accessible is this. You can just put in your values, your hex values, and off you go. So that's really cool. The, the other one, I'm trying to remember which one it was. Um, I think it was, maybe it was contrast A. Yeah, it's a, first of all, it's Flash, <laughs> which I had to I had to like Chrome has changed everything with Flash. They won't even let you run it now until you explicitly say yes, I want to run it. Once I got it running, you'll notice here like you have to do all these things that are very very inaccessible. Look at the the size of the type here. I mean, this is crazy stuff. But it is quite nice because you can just drag your mouse around and get the right colors, and then it, you can see like down in here all of these ch X's change to check marks as you get better contrast. So that's kind of nice, if you like flash. <laughs> all right. Any questions up to this point? All right. Oh. I, I have one. OK. I take it that you're actually on your website, and then you bring up one of these. Yeah. And then it'll check the website. 
Yeah, so some of them do. Some of them are just tools that you use that you can apply knowledge from those tools to your website. So like with the with the contrast checkers, you're just you're basically going from your website to the contrast checker to say I've got these two colors, do they contrast enough? And if they do, then you just take those new values and, and put them in your website. So yeah. So when you checked your website, did you bring your page out and you were able to run one of the tools and pull your, your website was good or not? Yeah. So the each individual that's that's what these are these ones here will do for you more. Yeah. So and then I didn't I didn't try every single one of these, but I think yeah, there's probably this is an extension, so I don't want to install that right now. I think Code Sniffer, I think you can put a URL in there. Yeah, or you can paste your code in there. So if you have like CSS or something or HTML, it'll, it'll tell you whether it's good. But yeah, I think most of these are like external to your site. All right, so um, like I said, Chris recorded this uh, presentation. He's going to walk us through one of his clients, Montverd. Um, and, and how he helped them. Um, so, yeah, we're going to just jump into that now. Hey, Rob, I figured it's easier to do a, a screencast because you might be able to share this with whoever's going to be doing the presentation or even play this uh, for, for the group. Um, I have a little bit of information around ADA because I've been working with state and local governments and federal projects back in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s. And back then, because the internet was so so in its infancy, there was some preliminary things that covered basics. But there has been a whole new um, spur of lawsuits that triggered, I think, around the time of Obama's administration. There were some small changes to that. And essentially, the, the lawyers just went on a rampage and started suing mostly big companies and they've already uh, extorted those those levels because people of 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 in those big companies, private companies, are stepped in and immediately fixed the issues that they had to. But they're targeting state and local governments, and the, and I'll, I'll go into why uh, they do that in just a second because there's a there's a glaring example. But I would I would just warn people that are basically from our standpoint, from designer business owners, if you're going to take on a state or local government. Um, I would immediately probably add at least another um, 30 to 50 percent onto the bid, and in some cases, if you feel terribly uncomfortable, double it, uh, because you're going to have to deal with not only a bunch of research, but most likely a, a, a tremendous back and forth, and going, and you might even have to hire a third-party audit company to absolutely prove. This really comes down to who believes who when. Uh, is in compliance of the law. There's some basic things that you have to keep in mind and almost all of it is covered by WordPress. That's That was the beauty and the main reason we were pushing uh, WordPress's, WordPress on our, on our particular websites very early in the design. I went into, I was a Joomla developer in the late 90s and early 2000s and then when I saw the accessibility stuff being caked in or, or baked into the WordPress uh, system, uh, it was an easy and it was an easy sell for me to basically start migrating all of our websites to that. The biggest thing with with ADA compliance is mostly around blind, and it really revolves around the website being read to you. So again, a lot of the things this is this is really an abyss because you can go through all of the layout of your design, you can go through all of the details and try to figure out how is this going to work. But the key, the key to me are, are top level basic stuff. Using text navigation, for example, instead of an image. Way back in the day, we, had, we sliced up images and we had rollovers and all those goofy things that people were like, wow, back then. But nowadays, when you use a text image uh, or a text navigation, not only do you have the ability to immediately translate that to uh, a voiceover, like a voice can take that and read that navigation now to a blind person, there are other things that come into play that are like, for example, uh, I have bad eyesight, so I need the text to be larger. So they, they essentially then, you've seen this with WordPress, you can immediately take with a CSS and easily upgrade uh, the, the text on the, on the page and make it larger. 
So I'm just going to show you here the town of Mount Verde that we just recently did last year. Um, the, the, this WordPress plugin here, I believe it's going to show the name of it right here. I think it's called UserWay, uh, userway.org. It's probably the most extensive one I've seen out there, and it covers just about all of the basics. But the beauty of it is, is that as soon as you build it into uh, your WordPress site, and as long as your design follows the basics that I'll go into in just a second, you're pretty much covered for an accessibility standpoint. I say pretty much because you're always going to have a lawyer that's non-techy and going to try and press and say that this is this and this is that. However, if you cover your bases in your contract, and again, keep make sure that you, you pad, your, pad your estimates because they're going to be more complicated than the typical small business. The lawyers are not targeting small businesses because there's no money there. They, they're looking to extort a quick payoff from a state or local government uh, because they are some of them are pretty complicated to fix and in reality they will have to settle because they are in vi violation. And I'll go through why in a second. So the big ones that you're covering here is the way that you're interacting with your keyboard. Some, some blind people have special accessibility keyboards that are much like Braille where they can, they can uh, hit key buttons and know exactly what they're doing. There's the contrast one where some people have uh, uh, color blindness that this allows them to see the navigation more clearly. This is, this is something that you got to think about because I do have one client that is colorblind. You got to be very sensitive to that red, green, colorblind. I, I, you can imagine having red text on a green background as being a horrible design decision, but that would essentially be invisible to somebody that's red, red green, blind. So there's a lot of key decisions in the way that you use your colors, but with these, with these plugins, you're essentially covered uh, for some of the basic stuff. So you can, you can do contrast, you can do light contrast, but these plugins take your, take your original design and take care of that, all of that for you. So we just basically built a, a base accessible design and then now you can see that the CSS takes over with this. This is all built in Divi and this was simply a plug-in add-on and now this is available to you. So you can test this plug-in with your websites to make sure that they work. But you'll notice now the next big one is your text. So using text navigation is huge. You got to have that for people that are seniors and things like that and are just having problems viewing the page. This is almost like a site friendly for even people our age of in the 40s, I would say. I'm getting to the point where I got to pull out my glasses to read some things too. So this is just a friendly thing more than it is basically an accessibility as well. Highlight links, some of these things are more like trying to find key things on the page. But this one is probably the big one that I've seen for uh, accessibility. It's the ability for the page to be read to somebody. People that are blind, and I, I would guarantee that this is almost like zero to maybe 0.1% of the people traveling all of these websites, but you have to basically do it by the law, is to have this accessibility read, read to you. Screen reader enabled. So Use now, the keys to select items to so now with read, read page, I could click on something or move, tab through the navigation and it will read off to me and it, like get, it goes back to that special keyboard again where they can essentially tab through the navigation read off the navigation and that's another thing for accessibility you have to have tab ability so you can tab through the different versions in your in your your website so like for example i'm going to go to, let's see if this works now oh now that the 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 plugin is highlighted but you, you get the idea like you can tab through your navigation it will read off each piece of your navigation so the navigation has to be explainable so that again uh, you can't have just like short little letters or numbers or something like that to note to and an image to show a particular navigation item again this is if you're working with WordPress and Divi you're you're probably already nine times out of ten already uh, ninety to ninety-five percent were WordPress accessible anyway, because that's just the nature of the design when you're working with those items. So again, it's a matter of being able to have that user friendliness of tech, text navigation, and things like that, and the structure. Uh, one of the big, big ones that I'm even right now still talking to Town of Mount Verde because it's it's essentially going to be a big expense for them is their their ability to lean on PDF forms. 
I can't stress this enough that if you see this uh, from a standpoint of um, working with a particular company, this will be one of the first things a lawyer will go after uh, as far as accessibility goes. The reason being is that when you scan a PDF, and you've probably seen this, I don't know if I can ex demonstrate this here with what's on the page. Yeah, so if, as you see here, I'm highlighting the text that's in this, in this PDF. If I can highlight the text, this means that this is a text indexed PDF. If you try to highlight it and the entire page turns purple or you can't highlight the text, you are dealing with an image-based PDF. An image-based PDF is essentially a JPEG. There's nothing there for the page to basically read off. So now any of the readers, because they're, Adobe claims to be ADA compliant and they've gone through great lobbying to basically prove that. However, their PDFs have to be basically translated as such. So probably the biggest thing that I've seen is scanned paper typically comes in as an image. It has to go through what's called an OCR to be translated into text. However, what I tell my clients now is if you type it up in Word and you use the typical uh, Adobe plugins or most of the other ones that are even open standard where it says P Word to PDF or print to PDF, it will translate the PDF as text. So this at least will get them close to ADA compliance. However, PDFs in general are not exactly user friendly. It's kind of a gray area, I would say, is that whenever they're dealing with PDFs, um, they're, they're already asking for it. So what I tell uh, state and local governments that in reality, they have to translate these PDF forms into web application forms. And web application forms, again, will follow ADA compliance because just like I mentioned here above, you'll have HTML labels that will read off what the field is. They'll be able to type into that field with their keyboard. And again, I don't, I, I'm, honestly, I don't know how this is working for somebody that's completely blind. However, they do have this capability. They have the ability to do it. And that's the main reason to be in compliance with the law is now they'll be able to tab and type, tab and type, tab and type. And, and each one of those labels in the forms will be read off to them and they'll know how to get to it. And then ultimately it will say submit button and they'll be able to submit their information using an online form. You cannot do that with a PDF. With a PDF form, even if you are looking at, like I mentioned a couple seconds ago, a text version, you might be able to pull that up in Adobe and they, if they have some kind of special software, it will read it off to them. And that's why I say it's that gray area. But ultimately, whenever I see PDFs, that's usually where the lawyers start circling and saying, wait a minute, you're not in compliance. Um, you need to, you, and then they, they basically go for that lawsuit against the town to see if they can get uh, some, some, some money out of them. Because it's, it's a, essentially a big job to translate. Some of the, like the Lake County one I just was dealing with a couple months ago, there's, I don't know, uh, probably 10,000 uh, Word documents, or I'm sorry, PDF versions, because essentially every one of their town meetings is in a PDF. Um, all of the notes that they have, all of their forms are in, 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 in PDF. And it was very easy for them to do because they're using Word and they simply just upload a PDF. And now someone has to go through and first check to see if the PDF is an image or an indexed, indexed uh, text and then try and figure out if they need to basically start building forms for it. So what we've been doing is we've been actually using uh, PDF forms and, or, or actually web, uh, or let me see if I can find one. Um, yeah, so meeting notes, for example, council meeting notes for Mount Verde, this was, this was our help to, towards getting them before. Again, they had everything issued as a PDF. Uh, so we built web forms inside, uh, and this was a custom WordPress app that we've created. We're thinking about releasing that as a plugin um, just to help people out. But these meeting notes will allow somebody then to basically make an, a pure HTML version, which again is easily, easily read by the reader because it's an HTML, it's within the website. 
and then that's that this page is now in ADA compliance because it, it's essentially tr uh, translated into an HTML page versus where a PDF they you break the navigation you go to a PDF page now you get the idea as far as why it would be uh, in compliance or would it why wouldn't it be in compliance? So again, I hope that this this explains a little bit about the the pure abyss that could be essentially ADA compliance. But think of of the in summary, if you can get them into a Divi design, WordPress design, you're ninety nine percent there. However, you might have to install a plugin or something like that to finish the rest of the way to be able to do the reading of the page and also be able to change things like the contrast and stuff like that. So the big takeaways are look for, look for PDFs and specifically image-based PDFs as being non-compliant. PDFs are kind of in that gray area that Adobe is still supporting an index PDF, but in my humble opinion, I think it's out of a compliance because essentially you're breaking the navigation. If you go to a form and it's now opened in a new tab, there's no way for you to give them a plugin unless now they download this PDF and they would have to know that because again, it breaks the navigation so they wouldn't know at that point, they don't know that they're off the main page unless something warns them. And now you have to download this, open it up in PDF locally and have their local local plugin read off the form to them. So again, I, I don't think PDFs in general um, constitute an ADA compliant website. Your best bet is to have everything translated into an actual HTML page and then using some kind of plugin to do the design changes and, and things that I mentioned. So for design, in summary, you wanna definitely have the ability to change the text you definitely want to give them the ability to deal with uh, color blindness in various levels. There's there's different uh, uh, problems, disabilities around interpreting color and 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 conflicts with color. So having this contrast piece and text essentially covers both those things. Animations. I don't know if you build those uh, uh, slider pages. That might be something that bothers somebody. The other thing is, is that because they slide across the page, the reader won't be able to catch them in time. So a lot, a lot of times those things can be annoying to people. I say when you're dealing with a state and local government, definitely just deal with a plain image background. Don't do animated uh, animations at all. Um, the, the other things is some of these at these added things like being able to highlight links and showing page structures, they're, they're add-ons that are okay. But the big ones for me is being able to read a page to a blind person, contrast and text for people that have disabilities for seeing, things like that, and the ability then to tab through your navigation and use the keyboard to navigate a website instead of having to do a point-click mouse thing because that a point-click mouse works only for somebody that can see. Essentially, their keyboard is gonna be the people that are, are blind. They're gonna be using their keyboard to both read the page to them as they tab through the navigation, and then they'll click enter to actually go into a particular navigation link and move through there. So I'm hoping that gives you at least a base starting point. Feel free to share this with the team, and I apologize for not being available to basically come and do this presentation. But uh, uh, again, th this, is, this is definitely an abyss. I recommend using only the, the government uh, versions of the websites. There's a lot of people trying to do summaries and explain what's going on with ADA, because, but because everything's so vague, nine times out of 10, they're trying to sell you on some kind of certification or audit services. I would, I would throw it out there that if anybody's looking to try and, and if they're interested in this and this piques their interest, this is definitely a big business because essentially if you can what's called certify somebody as being uh, ADA compliant, you're either getting a large uh, uh, payment to do a full audit of their website or you can essentially guarantee that they will be ADA and compliant by continuing to both build their website and monitor their website. So this is nothing to run away from, 
but I would definitely say that if you're dealing with state and local governments now, especially at this time because the lawyers are having a feeding frenzy, be absolutely sure that you cover yourself and your business and make sure that you're either bidding the contract at a higher rate and understanding what's involved or uh, pass if you, if you just don't feel comfortable doing it because uh, there, there definitely is more work with these websites than the typical uh, business website that you have a lot more freedom in the design and essentially you don't have to really worry about it. Um, hope this helps and have a great day. Talk to you soon. It's the world we live in. So any questions on, on that up to that point? Yes. I do. Oh, I'm sure you do. <laughs> um, so with ADA, obviously pretty much every other regulation has some sort of uh, provision out there for reasonable accommodations or undue hardship. Does any of that apply to design? Um, so there are levels of compliance. Um, you saw the A, AA, AAA. Um, if you can show a level of compliance, that's better than nothing. Okay. So I think that's what a lot of companies will do is, you know, they'll, they'll say, well, you know, we feel like, you know, our lawyers are telling us that we can get away with, you know, double A compliance some, somewhere in the middle. Right. Uh, Cause not every, every website's different. Every website has different, you know, requirements and things like that. Um, different levels of risk exposure. Um, governments, huge level of risk exposure because people love to go after governments when they don't do things right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so small bit growing. So, yeah. So I guess the second question I have, nobody else has, <laughs> um, especially with governments that I've worked with in the past, you have the yeah. ability to transfer that risk of ADA lawsuits towards you. For example, the town meeting minutes. Can you transfer that to a service provider that specializes in that and reduce your risk? Of that's a good question. Um, that's where I that's where I put, say, put on my T-shirt that says I am not a lawyer, uh, <laughs> but I imagine that if if you have a lawyer and they're and you're reviewing your contracts closely enough uh, contracts with third party service providers that any ADA issues that arise are going to fall on them and indemnify yourself. That's about as far as I know how to say. I, I don't speak lawyer, but that's some things that I've picked up. Um, but yeah, I think I think if you're if you're careful about it, you can negotiate and, and contract in, in certain ways to make it their their problem, not yours. Um, and and I, I would, you know, I'm trying to pick providers and vendors that I use that will be thinking about accessibility even more. So it's, it's time. We've had 20 years on this thing. <laughs> yeah. Are a lot of the visually impaired disabilities, like dyslexia and yeah. provisions, are they covered by having reader, the ability to be read? Yes. Yeah. The uh, reading it aloud is a um, is a is a workaround for dyslexia issues, just like you know blindness would be. So having it read aloud is is taking the text as, as it actually is and reading it to you in, in you know text to speech, where the computer can actually read it, but where your eyes may trick you. So, yeah. so basically, that really the main thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of what he was getting at: is make sure that they can they can at least have it read to them and that they can at least make the text bigger and that they can at least change the contrast. Other things are nice, like stopping the animations and, and highlighting the links and tabbing through everything, but those are the main things. Like if they can't read it, they can't see it, they can't hear it, then it's useless. So, so prioritize those things first and everything else kind of falls into line eventually. So, yeah. I would assume this is like very low percentage of websites that are ADA compliant, mm -hmm. but this is to be a Absolutely. Yeah, there's a ton there's a ton of potential upside for anybody who wants to get into this space. I'm trying to get into the space, you know, with with my web agency, you know, I I'm I'm telling people, you know, like, "Hey, did, did you think about this?" And I had one client go, "You're totally right. Didn't even occur to me. We need to do this." So, you know, it's it's something you can add to the 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 contract and be upfront with people. If you're going to if you're if you're doing web design, tell them, "Hey, this this is expensive stuff. You know, I'm not even going to lie to you. There there's a lot of work that has to be done, but like Chris was saying the Divi, a lot of the themes, the, the the top tier, very popular themes, they have a lot at stake, and so they will build this stuff in automatically and make it easy for you to do those things. So like I, that's why I use Divi, the the theme builder, or the page builder, because it it kind of builds that stuff in for you. It's not perfect. There's some, it's got some weaknesses, but it's way better than trying to do just mix it up on your own. So, <laughs> yeah, so.
between that and the plug-in, right? Yeah, between that and the plug-in, you're mostly covered. Yeah, as long as you provide that plug-in. I mean, most visually impaired people or people who use computers but have issues, uh, they'll they'll recognize that right away and say, oh, I can use UserWay. It's on there. So, yep. Do you know what any of the upper tiers of the, the other plugins, the paid plugins, are? Um, like the price, like the highest price for them, or what they do. Oh, what they do? It's pretty much like UserWay. Okay. Yeah, UserWay is kind of like fan supported. You can donate to it, and so a lot of people do because they like free. <laughs> so that's why they don't offer it to you at at a, at a, at a price because it's supported by the community and, and user donations. So a lot of people use it for that reason because it is free, <laughs> you know, so why not, you know. But there are other ones where, you know, it's worth it to some people to pay for this additional level of support that you get because usually with donationware, like community contributed stuff, you have to just wait interminably for certain features to arrive. Mm -hmm. But if you're paying for the privilege of having support, those companies will definitely jump on new issues earlier. So. There's ups and downs for all of that. So yeah. As an example, that little uh, event mm -hmm. terminal. Yeah. That wouldn't be technically ADA compliant unless you had underneath it all these same information and text. Right? Yep. Mhm. Mm okay. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All of the, uh, you're talking about the video here, like this, the. That little image. This image here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That, that that image would would have problems unless you use like the alt attribute of the image. Um, it is a lot. <laughs> it is a ton. But you can. Yeah, they would want a caption or use a long description. I was actually looking at that the other day. Like, how do I take this long amount of information in this image? You can use a long description. You can actually, you know, reference links within the long description that the reader will then link link over to, and let you interact with it. And that's all in the W3 document. So. Well, this is a video because I, I had it as a video on the presentation. The, yeah, but the, the real website, it's just yeah. a, yeah. Sorry, it's, it's kind of confusing because of the way I've got this set up. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And captions is that that can contribute to your SEO. Yep. Too. Yeah. So you're thinking about that Absolutely. as well. Yep. Yeah, anything you do for ADA compliance automatically um, helps you with Google and with SEO. Um, ADA compliance, um, if you're doing it right, you're going to make your images small so they load fast. Um, small, not in dimensions, but in file size. So they load fast, so that's automatically going to benefit you. If you're using a lot of text to describe things, that's going to be a huge benefit. So, yeah. So build that stuff into your workflow, and it'll just kind of naturally come out of it. So.